For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech, my preaching, were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Without the power of God, we have nothing. I have nothing to offer you today without the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach him and him crucified. He is the solution to all of our problems. He is the balm for our wounds. He is the answer for our eternity. And so let us look to Christ. Crucified, raised from the dead, exalted to the right hand of God. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13. While you're turning, I'll remind you that uh, last week, Jesus, where we left off, Jesus was teaching and preparing his disciples to be able to stand against the face of uh, adversity, being able to stand against the face of oppression and persecution, how one might stand uh, in light of a wicked world. To be able to stand with Uh, Nothing to fear, nothing to hide, unashamed, unafraid. And it was a very profound uh, message for Jesus' day, especially when you consider that all of them there, with the exception of John, would meet an untimely death. Every one of them. And that uh, that all of them would have their, their uh, their faith tested. And all of them would prove true, except for Judas. So, uh... In light of that instruction and on the heels of that instruction, we pick up our reading at verse 13 today. If you could please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? Arbitrator. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns, build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many uh, goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them, of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by worshiping or by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are un- not able to do the least, why are you so anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of those. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have any, uh, an anxious mind. For all these things are the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things which shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us pray. Father, speak to us and give us the words of life. Whatever we need to know, please instruct us by your Spirit. And Father, if it offends us, let us determine between offense and conviction. For your Father, your your word is like a two-edged sword. It pierces. 
and it ought to. So God, I pray that you would move in our midst today. Focus us upon Christ. Focus us upon eternal things. And Father, as we read your word, help us to understand that it is blessed. But we pray now, Father, for the reading of your word, that you would bless it, and by your spirit that we might take it and apply it in our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This passage today is about vertical living in a horizontal world, isn't it? That there's a lot of stuff that's going wrong uh, in our uh, American context, but there was a lot of stuff that was going wrong in the first century context that Jesus was instructing in. So we're going to find similarities and parallels between Jesus' day and our day, and it's always striking to me how the Word of God is timeless, timely, and true. And I would say it's timeless and timely because it is true. And uh, so, so we just stand in amazement today how this can, uh, can place, a passage of Scripture can place its finger on the pulse of 21st century America just the same and just as easy as it could 2,000 years ago in Palestine. I was reminded as I was reading over this this week of uh, a 2005 song that most of you in here have never heard of, but uh, it goes something like this. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll recite it to you anyway. It's by System of a Down. I know that none of you in here have ever heard of that, but it says, why don't you ask the kids in Tenement Square? Was fashion the reason why they were there? They disguise it, hypnotize it, and television made you buy it. And what he's talking about there is the juxtaposition between what was going on in Tiananmen Square in 1989 versus what was going on in America since 1989. That's, you know, the kids that were willing to lay down their lives and die and be ground into paste in Tiananmen Square uh, for the sake of freedom and liberty, while those in we the Western world are worried about what brand of jeans they're wearing. You see the difference there? It's striking, and this, the, the uh, songwriter puts his finger on that and, and shows us, and it, and it hurts. That 1989 massacre, that protest for freedom that was ruthlessly crushed. Did you ever think that within a decade, those people who had been uh, put down while they were demonstrating for freedom, within a decade, those people who were denied liberty were the ones responsible for manufacturing virtually everything that we buy within a decade, within 10 years. So here we are then, uh, our freedom, which leads to, and as we abuse our freedom, leads to materialism and consumerism that lulls us into a state of complacency where we just want to buy, 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 buy. We need the next new thing. It is our freedom. By the way, we're willing to forfeit that freedom so that we might be able to sustain the level of comfort that we have. We're willing to for forfeit our freedom. They're willing to die for freedom. We're willing to give ours away so that we might be safe. Do you see the difference? But incidentally, our freedom, while we buy these things, actually ends up enslaving both people, the Chinese and the Americans. The producers and the consumers are enslaved as a result of greed, materialism, crass materialism, consumerism. I ask you this, is this how Christians are supposed to live? Is this how Christians are supposed to live? Is there a way for a Christian who is caught up in the American culture of things, the American dream, is there a way for us to be able to disengage and reverse course? Jesus says that there is. It's found in verse 31. Seek the kingdom of God. In Matthew's account, chapter 6, uh, this is included in the Sermon of, on the Mount. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. Jesus says if we put, G uh, put the kingdom first, all this other stuff's going to fall into place. Well, my friend, there's no doubt about it, and we, we make this clear to you on a weekly basis that Christians are called to kingdom living, that Christians are called to uh, a higher purpose, that we're to live vertically before we live horizontally. 
Now, while the world tells us, no, it's just about horizontal living, what you can get and what you can gain and what you possess and what you can hoard, that's horizontal living. Do unto others before they can do it to you. Get yours. See what's in it for you. You can have it your way. Just do it. No, vertical living says seek God first. Seek his kingdom first and his righteousness, the Bible tells us. We're to live vertically. And, and in our passage today, Jesus forbids uh, uh, four things. Verse 15, he forbids greed. Verse four, uh, uh, 22, he forbids worry. Verse 29, he forbids obsessing over things. He forbids, in verse 32, living in fear. Now, you tell me that that doesn't define 21st century American culture today? Does it define you? Does it define who we are as a nation and as a people? Does it define our churches when most of the churches are telling you to give so you can get? Come on in. Get what you can get. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to own stuff. God wants you to have the desires of your heart. You just ask him for it and he'll give it to you. Well, Jesus forget, forbids these things. And this does define us, doesn't it? Greed and worry, obsession and fear. But Jesus also gives us an antidote. Look in verse 21. Uh, in essence, be rich toward God. Verse 31, seek God's kingdom. Verse 34, treasure God above all. That's the antidote, you see. This is the antidote for the rat race that we find ourselves caught up in. Really, this is an indictment on a any culture, because you don't have to be predominantly wealthy. And listen, we live in the United States. <clears throat> We're wealthy compared to everybody else. We are wealthy. But it doesn't just uh, pertain to us in the Western world. It, it can pertain to any culture at any time. Whether you're squabbling over uh, goats and eggs or whether you're squabbling over gold and stocks, it still has the same application. And this is an indictment on any culture and any individual who values possessions and comfort and security over faithful devotion to God. So before we go a step further in this process, I want you to know that this convicts me the same as it ought to convict you. That there's none of us going to be able to say, I, wish, I hope that guy's listening. Because we all need to be listening to this. Because we live in America. And because we have been misled. And because, uh, because we're human. We're fallen, right? And, and in the Garden of Eden, Adam didn't have to worry about these things. But as a result of his sin, then greed and, ang ang er, and worry and obsession, and, and anxiety, uh, fear, it all crept in as a result of that. So when we think of these things, we need to remind ourselves it's because we're fallen human beings and who are in need of the grace that God provides through the cross of Calvary by virtue of the death, the sacrificial atoning death of his son. Jesus really is the answer to everything. And whether or not it's, it's a, a really working for you, it might be a matter of priorities. Whether or not it's working for me, it might be a matter of priorities. We might have things out of whack here. We might be living horizontally when we should be living vertically. Well, let's get to the end of this today, shall we, and see where we stand. We want to begin today with an ill-timed interruption. Anybody that's preached or even taught school or any kind of a class, we'll be able to sympathize with Jesus right here. He has just given instruction about how to be able to stand unafraid and unashamed, that you're going to be persecuted. You gotta, you're going to depend upon the Holy Spirit to give you the words that you need in that moment, and then there in the crowd, remember there is always the crowd? One pops up and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I want to talk about off-topic what to talk about off topic has nothing to do with anything, does it? Jesus isn't talking about this. But this is what's on the heart and the mind of this man. Everybody could hear what he was telling to the disciples. And no doubt he had begun to instruct the crowds 
And then this voice rings out, and it's not even a request, it's a command, isn't it? That, that he is considering Jesus to be just like any other rabbi that's out there. And rabbis did serve as arbitrators in minor disputes amongst uh, 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 fellow citizens and among uh, uh, family members. And we do know that when there's a death in a family, that, that the oldest gets the double portion, and then he is responsible for, uh, for uh, distributing that to the, uh, to the younger. And we're only assuming now that this is a younger son who is talking about the older brother, and perhaps the older brother isn't distributing. So maybe it's not just the youngest brother who's greedy, maybe the both are greedy. But we don't know that. All I know is this guy is out in left field, and he is distracting. So I sympathize with Jesus here as this man demands not an adjudication, but he demands a judgment in his favor. Notice how Jesus responds to him. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Man, Remember last week how he responded and addressed his disciples, friends? See the difference here? Man, that, it doesn't get any more bland than that. It doesn't get any more generic than that. Jesus wasn't happy with him. Jesus wasn't thrilled. Thank you. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Yes, there is. <laughs> Let's just get that out there right now. There is. If it's off topic, if it has nothing to do with the subject matter that we're talking about, it's a dumb, it's a stupid question. And I am oftentimes just absolutely baffled after, especially on the Wednesday nights, you know, you're, you're preaching and teaching and, 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 and laying it out there, and then one of them will, oh, it's so urgent a question, and you call on them, and it's something completely off topic. But I expect that out of those kids. What I don't expect it out of are you adults. And oftentimes, I'm telling you that oftentimes people will leave out and, you know, it makes you wonder, what have I, what have I just spent the last hour doing? Was I, was I speaking gibberish? Or does this ever sink in? Because we'll leave out of here and our concerns that we brought in with us, we'll take them when we leave. And we didn't pay any consideration at all for the words of God that were preached forcefully, boldly, but preached from the pulpit. My friend, it ought to, you ought to be different when you leave the house of God than when you got there. You know, all of your burdens. But we bring them with us and we take them home. This man came to see Jesus. He brought his burden with him. And it didn't matter about Jesus talking about you're going to be persecuted. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. You're going to be, need to stand unafraid and unashamed. That doesn't matter. My brother's hoarding our inheritance. So what are you going to do about it, Jesus? I want you to notice that Jesus didn't come to get involved in family disputes, did he? Any more than he came to get involved in politics. He says, I'm not yet the judge, in essence. I'm here to, I've come to seek and to save those who were lost. I've come to bring people to God, not property, to people. Let that ring out in the pulpits of America today. All of the nonsense that's going on. Jesus is the Savior, you see. There's coming a day when he will be the judge. And this is why we're trying to prepare people for heaven. And I was reminded this week, and Ray and I had this conversation before uh, our, our, uh, our lessons, and then uh, here we get uh, one of the speakers of the hour uh, puts his finger right on it and says, hey, th this is what you need to understand. And I so I'm going to take this as an opportunity. I'm going to say God wants you to know this. Evidently, my job and my role as a pastor is to prepare you for heaven, prepare you for eternity. So if you get offended by the things that I say and the exhortations that I make to you, I want you first and foremost to draw a line right there. And even those of you listening at home, when I offend you, stop right there and make sure it isn't first conviction. If it's coming from the Word of God and it's the application to your life that offends you, then, friend, it's conviction. There's a difference. You need to repent of it and you need to correct course. My job is not here to placate you. 
My job is not here is not to uh, give you warm fuzzies. My job is to fit you for heaven by God's grace. To keep pointing you vertical, 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 vertical. Don't you understand? We're all going to die. Every one of us. If the Lord tarries. And what then? So, uh, Jesus come to seek and to save those who were lost. He didn't come to give you stuff. And not only is this an interruption that is ill-timed, it's also tone deaf. Tone deaf. Because it's completely away from the topic that he's talking about. And not only that is, really, it, it creates an opportunity then for Jesus to say, okay, here you go. Your minds are on all the wrong things. So God, uh, Jesus, as a masterful teacher, turns around, beginning of verse 15, and gives a timely instruction that we, uh, we need to look at. He says to them, verse 15, notice he's saying to them. He says to them, all of them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So here is a strong warning against covetousness, which is every kind of greed. Every kind of greed. And it is a dual command. It means there's two, two commands wrapped up here in this one verse. The dual command is to take heed, which means to be vigilant and to be careful, and also it is to beware, which means to guard oneself or to keep oneself from indulging in certain things. Either way, both of them are timely and timeless for us today. Both of these we need to know about, that we need to take heed and to beware of covetousness. Then he goes on to say, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things. He defines for us here what life is by telling us what it is not. What is life not? It is not about an abundance of possessions. It's not about an abundance of possessions. When you went to your closet this morning, did it take you a little while to figure out what you're going to wear? Do you have to rummage through your sock drawer to see which pair you want to wear? Not if there is a pair of socks, but is, you know, which one of these? Guilty. Guilty. I can't even close my sock drawer. I'm so afraid of not having socks in there that I've just got it crammed full and in reality i only wear like three pair of them they get wore out and wash so much but i mean that's just that's on me isn't it and then you just extrapolate that into your money and your your fun and games and everything else that that consumes us in the american culture it, jesus says life is not about those things now here, interesting enough, in verse 15, uh, the word for life in the, in the uh, original Greek is zoe, which is not the typical term for life, which is usually suke, which is the same word we use for soul. So we can say then that it is almost virtually in the, in the mind of God, it is impossible to separate our life from our soul here on earth. That whatever we long for in our deepest recesses of our hearts, that will dictate how we live. But that's not the one he's talking about here in verse 15. Verse 15, he's talking about the actions and events that occur in living, the essence of one's life. And he says the essence of your life shouldn't be about how much stuff you own. So go, home, go out in the parking lot and scrape that bumper sticker off that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. Scrape that off of there. That's unbiblical, you see. Jesus is warning us against that. And at the root of this is greed, right? And what, what is greed? We all know what greed is, but greed seeks possessions. And he says, I don't want you to confuse this with true living. As a matter of fact, seeking possessions is a substitute for the proper object of a man's search for things or, or for worship, and that is God. So it is really, truthfully, we can say that greed is idolatry. And if you don't believe me, look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. 
Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. There it is. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Do you ever think that the things that you're heaping up for yourselves are idols? Jesus says they are. Greed is idolatry. Well, if you ever wonder and want to see what the Bible says about this, uh, Ecclesiastes is a great place to look, and I would encourage you to turn in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. What, what the book of Ecclesiastes is is a vanity. Vanity upon vanity, that a man lives his life and he, he experiences all these different things uh, that the world tells him this is living. And once he experiences them, he looks back and he says, I'm unfulfilled. This is vanity. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, but surely this was also vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? Uh, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine my, uh, while guiding my heart with wisdom, how to lay hold on folly. All of it, you see, is folly. I built myself houses. I made my works great. I planted vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of... In other words, I'm heaping into myself wealth. It's all vanity, isn't it? He says it's all vanity. Look at verse 18 of Ecclesiastes 2, uh, or, or write this down or look it up when you get home. I probably work better that way. Therefore, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. We flip to chapter 6. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is a common among men, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity. Is an evil effect, affliction. All the labor, verse 7, of man is for his mouth, yet his soul is not satisfied. Need I go on? The wisdom from the Old Testament. You're going to kill yourself, rack yourself, uh, exert yourself so that you can have more stuff so that when you die, somebody else will belong, uh, will belong to somebody else? So that the next person coming along, you're going to spit shine everything that you've got and you're going to hoard it for yourself so that the next person comes along is not going to treat it with the same level of respect. For It's all vanity. Incidentally, the word for vanity there means meaningless, vapor, emptiness, and idle. Vanity, our work, our labor, accumulating things is idolatry. Well, he gives us a parable. I, I noticed that the silence has set in. He gives us a parable to reinforce his, his, his instruction. Verse 16, he speaks of this certain rich man who had a, a farm that yielded plentifully. And there was all kinds. There was an overabundance. And he looked around and he said, this is doing so good. I'm going to paraphrase this for the sake of time. This is doing so well, I don't have any room to store it. So I'm going to tear down the barns that I have in order to build new barns. And he says, I'm going to do this. Look at verse 18. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Notice how many eyes and my are in that passage. And it's a parable. And Jesus is giving this to us for a reason. But notice as well that he had many plants. And these plans make sense horizontally. There's nothing wrong. If you're looking on the horizontal plane, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the plans this man made. If you're the center of everything. If it only matters uh, how many uh, toys you end up with when you die. If it only matters that you've got more than you ever need. This makes perfect sense. That's living horizontally, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, notice I, me, my... 
many plans, but notice that he did not include the vertical, which is God. You want to talk about an untimely interruption. Look at verse 20. But God said to him, fool. And this, that word for fool is not just like you know, you know, a silly throwaway, castaway word. Uh, in, in the original, it, it means one who has ignored the precepts of God for the way that they live. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. It's a fool, somebody who has rejected God and his standard for living. But God said to him, you got all kinds of plans, pal. These are good plans. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? God interrupts his plans. It is an untimely interruption, isn't it? In my life, how many people I've dealt with who have had their plans interrupted? Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans, right? So isn't death. So isn't death. That, that we, we don't know. Our life is but a vapor. It appears for a little while. Vanishes away. That it's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. God, Jesus is wanting them to know that God required this man's soul despite all of his plans, no, despite how great the harvest was, despite the fact that he had many and, and, and much for not only his generation but generations to come. And he says that you're, you fool, your soul will be required of you this night, tonight. Required means to demand something back, something that is due to be returned to one's ownership, to ask for it back. You understand, my friend, that you owe something to God. You owe your soul, and he'll call for it one day. What then on that day? When he, re when he requires your soul, will you be able to say, well, I've got all these barns and they're chock full of good things? He'll say, I've been looking for people to live in vertically, not horizontally. Depart from me, I never knew you. You're just like the fool that Jesus taught about, who reject the knowledge and the precepts of God as a basis for life. Oh, my friend, if you'd understand that it's not about what we own, is it? It's not about what you own. It's about what you owe to God. Not what we own. It's about what we owe. And that we're told then to be rich. Look at verse 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, I want you to notice here with me that this is not a license for laziness. Men, you have an obligation to provide for your families as best as you can. All of us, we have a, a, an obligation to uh, exercise the gifts that God has given us, to maximize our, our talents and our abilities as God has seen fit to meet them out to us. We have that obligation. Our work is worship before God. Whatsoever we do, we do as unto the Lord. What we're saying, though, while this is not a license for laziness, it is an appeal to priority. If we're putting our work before God, idolatry, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I was talking to a man, a very wealthy man. And when I say wealthy, I'm saying wealthy beyond what you and I even can fathom. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I'm talking to this fellow, I kind of stagger at it myself. I don't know how in the world he does it, but he's got it, you know. I don't fault him for it. But he said to me, I'm only going to do this for a couple more years. He said, this is grinding me down. He said, this is, this is too much. And I said, well, the fact of the matter is you could give up tomorrow. You've made enough for 10 families for 10 generations. You can give it up tomorrow, but you won't because you are accustomed to a certain level of comfort, a certain level of prestige that comes along with that kind of wealth. And then I had to be honest with him. 
And I said, well, I am no different. While it isn't the heaped up amount of wealth that he has, for me it's a matter of security that is my idol. That I want security. I don't want to have to struggle like my parents did when I was a kid growing up. I don't want to have to worry about those things. By God's grace, I never have. But if I don't have it prioritized, you see how this can lead me horizontally right into the pit of hell? And I can be singing the songs and I can be living the dream and everybody be patting me on the back in the church, but I've got an idol if I'm not careful. It's a matter of priority. It really is. Well, then how should we live? Well, Jesus gives us a, con a confronting corrective. A confronting corrective. How then shall we live? Look at verse 22 first. Then he said to his disciples. Okay, he's talking to the crowd, and this is good for anybody in the crowd. We can say and shout this to America, the culture at large. Don't be greedy. And beware of greed. Don't live like that. But now we're talking to Christians. We're talking to people who will drag their carcasses into a Lord's house uh, on a Lord's Day morning for the hope of hearing God's message for them. That's me and you. He's talking to his disciples now, and he says, Therefore I say to you, here's our first corrective, do not worry about your life. Notice I, he had to talk to these disciples who had been walking with him for some three years now. They saw what he did. They were getting an inkling who he was. Notice they still worried. If they didn't worry, he wouldn't have to give them the instruction, right? So this is something that needs correcting in all of us from time to time. And we're saying that worry is something different than concern. Concern is something that we're on the lookout for and we're making plans in case this happens. Worry, on the other hand, is dying in one battle after fi fighting a thousand. Right? We're only going to be able to, to fight one or, or die in one battle, but why is it that we're going to fight all these others? Worry is like sitting in a, a, a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't take you anywhere. That's worry. And he's telling us here that we need not to worry about life. And here, that word is suke, but it also is interchangeable with soul. So what he is saying here, that man's entire moral and mental activity, that condition of living, his state of being alive, that encompasses health and happiness and energy and whatever. He says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Easy Easier said than done, I suppose. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will put on. These are things that we need in order to live. Food and shelter, clothing. We need these things. And Jesus says, don't worry about your living conditions. Don't worry about your ability to live. These temporal needs, food and clothes. Because life is more than temporal, that's horizontal, it is vertical, right? And he gives us two examples of ra uh, ravens and lilies. Consider the ravens. Remember last week he spoke about sparrows. He said you're more valuable than a little bird. Now he's telling us you're more valuable than a raven. It's a bigger bird. It's a crow. It's a nasty looking thing. You're more important than them. The ravens, they don't sow or reap, but somehow they eat. How is it that they eat? God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? What about the lilies? They don't do anything except for grow. And yet, he says, even King Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't as beautiful as a lily. Think about how, how frail and fragile a, a, a flower is. Uh, you know me. I like morning glories. I like to see them come out in the morning, and they're like, what's up? <laughs> and then uh, as soon as the morning passes, they're like, you've seen enough. I'll be back tomorrow. Get up. Be watching. But other than these flowers that are so beautiful, and I work in a funeral home, and I'm, I can't believe I'm saying this because I always said, flowers are work. 
You know, you take, you carry them here, you place them there, you arrange them there. That's not good enough. You got to move them over here, and somebody else put this in there, and it's not good enough because you didn't touch it. So you got to turn it the way that you want it. And then when the family gets there, they want that move. So it's all work to me. But to stop and look at them, how beautiful they are, and they're not going to last but a day or two. They're gorgeous. It's a reminder if God loves the, His creation that much to put that His splendor. In something that's going to be cut down, thrown in the fire that fast. How much more does he care for you and I to display his glory in our lives? Can we trust him? Is he worthy of our trust? It's more than just temporal. You see, it's vertical as well, right? And the ravens and the lilies are a reminder that God's going to take care of us. Look at verse 25. And which of you, by worrying, incidentally, we heard this this week too, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush around and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it should be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Can we learn anything from God's creation? Yeah, we can learn that these birds trust God to feed them, but we won't. So we've got to get our priorities out of whack and chase after the wrong things. This is a confronting corrective. Verses 25 and 26, he says, you can worry all you want to. You're not going to add not one little cubit to your, to your uh, stature. And we don't know if this has to do with time or with, uh, with length. I, I kind of go toward time. Some of your translations will say an hour to your life. I, I agree with that, but the same word is used. It, it basically means uh, a, a cubit's about 18 inches. The, the span of time that it would take for you to walk 18 inches. I believe it. Is that right? 18 inches a cubit? Pretty close. Well, you can look it up and prove me wrong. Whatever it is, is a short distance. And whatever, whatever amount of time it takes to take that step, he says you can't even add that to your life. Now you say, well, I like the fact that, uh, that it has to do with height because I read from King James or whatever. Okay, you're not going to be able to worry and add not, a little, not even an inch to your, to your height. You see, it doesn't matter. You can worry all you want to. You can't add to the length of your life, and you can't add to your stature, to your height. So stop worrying. Does the church in America need to know this? Does our culture need to know this? As a culture that has, by and large, uh, been uh, guilty of greed and anxiety and worry and, uh, and fear. They need to know this. Now, listen, they don't need to know that you and I have never experienced these things. They need to know that you and I have experienced them, but by the, the glory of the cross of Calvary, we're delivered from it. That's what they need to know. That there is a corrective here that we have gone by way of the cross and we have laid all of our cares there. That's why we can venture back out into public. That's how come we can uh, 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 not worry and fret over what the stock market's doing. That's why we can wor don't have to worry and fret about what, what's going on in that hospital. Because he cares for lilies and sparrows and ravens. And he cares infinitely more for those that belong to him. Now, that's comfort. That's vertical. Worry can't add anything. You can't add seconds to your life. You can't add any uh, distance to your height. But we need to look at vertical here. If then you're not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? In other words... Don't you understand that God is sovereign? That God has ordered everything? He is sovereign even over the necessities of our life? And let's be honest with each other. The things that we worry about and the things that we pray to God about and the things that we, uh, uh, that we are uh, anxious about, if we lived in a third world country, would never be even a blip on the radar. because we've got more than what we really need. Oh God, I pray, you might say, I've had sleepless nights that the, my carpet will get delivered. 
Now, you're going to hear this in a lot of places. A lot of places are going to say, if, it, if, it concern, if you're concerned about it, then God's concerned about it. What you're going to hear here is, why don't you just trust God and quit worrying about those little minor things? As a matter of fact, some of those things need to be purged from your heart and confess before God as unneeded concerns. Oh, God, I just wish that... You know, think about this. Our greediness and our, and our worry, our anxiousness and all of this, it makes us live places we don't want to live. It makes us to go places we don't want to go. It makes us uh, 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 do things that we don't want to do. That's just our jobs, right? God is sovereign. And there's not one person here, and I want you to listen to me, please. And I mean this as humbly as I possibly can. There's not one of us here who will die one second too soon or one second too late. Not one of us. For it is appointed unto man once to die. Then after this, the judgment. Your soul might be required of you today. You owe it to God. The question is, will you be able to stand there unafraid and unashamed? Look at verse 29. He says, don't seek. That word means do not seek means do not set your heart on. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink. Do not set your heart on. Do not obsess over. Don't be obsessed over these things because before long they're going to own you. How true this is, we begin by owning things, and before long, they own us. We start by running our businesses. Before long, our businesses run us. And don't be of an anxious mind, nor have an anxious mind. The word there uh, for anxious means something that is raised up or suspended, and really, what it, it, it's a nautical term, like a buoy or a boat bobbing around in the ocean on waves. That's what that means. And don't be like that. Don't let your mind be like that. James has something to say about that too, right? Double-minded person. He uses different terminology, but the same uh, uh, mindset. A double-minded person is like waves being t tossed to and fro. Don't think that person's going to receive anything because they're double-minded, flighty, one might say. Well, Jesus is saying here, do not worry and do not be anxious bobbing around like that. That's a lesson for all of us, right? Those of us that have been crushed by life, those of us who have been kicked in the teeth, and I don't mean to discount anything that we experience in our lives because we'll all be there. We'll all leave this life bearing our own scars. And there are concerns, genuine concerns. We're talking about making God a priority here, living a vertical in a horizontal world when uh, the world will tell us, oh my, that happened to you. There's no coming back from it. A vertical thinking person, a vertical living person says, yes. <laughs> yes. There is a way to come back from it. We're unashamed. We're unafraid. And my God is good and ill that he blesses is for my good, and unblessed good is ill, and all is right that seems so wrong, if it be his sweet will. Yes, this hurts. Yes, it leaves a mark, but it's for his glory and for my good eventually. See, that's vertical living. And notice the dichotomy here. That, that you, You've got to see this. What he is basically telling, verse 31, or, or verse uh, 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. That word for and there could be uh, translated as but. But your Father knows that you need these things. Think about this. We're about to close, so let me just keep your attention just a little while longer. There is a dichotomy here. He's saying that the unsaved nations seek after these things, and somehow they get them, right? Somehow they get them, but the unsaved people out there seek after these things. They're obsessed with them. They're, they're seeking after them. But you serve a sovereign God who knows that you need them. So what this really is, is a call not to be like the unbelieving world and to be able just to trust God to provide for us our necessities. 
not your Mercedes Benz. And if any of you drive a Mercedes, I apologize. I uh, also need a loan, but <laughs> beside the point. Not uh, for your, uh, you know, your 20-room house that you've always wanted. No. God promises to provide. If we're putting him first, we'll eat and be clothed. You see, it's not a matter of what I'm going to, you know, what should I wear today. It's a matter of which one should I wear today. And I am keenly aware that in many places on the face of this planet, there are preachers standing in the pulpit dressed in the only suit that they have. And they wear it week in and week out because it's all they can afford. So I'm humbled by that. Notice also verse 31, he says, seek. There's that word again, to set your heart on. Don't seek after certain things, but now here, seek or set your heart on, strive for, obsess over God's kingdom. I know that there are people that say, all oh, this business, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That is usually extended as a cop-out. I've heard this in my uh, years of preaching. At first, you know, people ignored me because I didn't know what I was talking about. Then in time, they ignore me because I do know what I'm talking about. I'm just too uh, hard about it. There's no winning. And I don't know when that line was crossed. I don't know. It's kind of like with my, you know, I was always too young and now I'm too old. So I don't know when I crossed that line either. But I'm going to say it was just a sliver of a second. It was quick. And before, li before long, I'm on the backside looking in, right? Well, I I I'm just telling you here that we're to be obsessed with the kingdom of God. And to, to have to even explain this to a building full of blood-bought believers shows the sign of the times in which we live. That, yes, we must be obsessed with God's kingdom because unless we receive the kingdom of God, unless we receive that through Christ, we'll leave this world unsaved and damned to hell. There are some things worth being obsessed over. Notice he says that as you seek God's kingdom, these things will be added to you. When the vertical is our greatest desire, then the horizontal will be provided. But here's the thing about that horizontal provision. Our goals, our needs, our ambitions will change because we're living vertically. It'll change because we're living. Our desires will line up more with God's desires. We'll want the blue bicycle that's stored up for us in the garage. That's for another date. Some of you will know what I mean. We'll desire to have what it is that he wants us to have. Then, he's a great God, isn't he? Look at verse 32, don't fear. Do not fear, little flock. Oh, you little flock, do not fear. In Jesus' day, he's talking to his disciples. It was smaller than they thought. There was only 11 out of the 12 that was true. In our day, it's even smaller than we think. I wonder how many of the folks in here aren't really saved and just going through the motions. Because I'd talk like that. I told you, I, my only job is to fit you for heaven. And if I'm not willing to do that, if I'm not willing to put my finger on the ouchies and say, does this hurt, then uh, you shouldn't even have me up here. Go get you somebody else. Uh, it's the reality of it. I wonder how small the flock really is who will inherit the kingdom. But I want you to notice this, these that need fed, these that need provided for, these that need the, uh, the affirmation of God uh, to provide for them, this little flock is someday, it's going to be the Father's good pleasure to give to them the kingdom. Here's the keys to the kingdom, little flock, you persevered. All of this is yours. You see, trusting in God to provide liberates us from grasping in the pursuit of te temporary things, doesn't it? And we start to live with eternity in our minds to gain the eternal kingdom. Well, we'll close with a very uncomfortable calling. Sell what you have, give alms, provide for yourselves money bags, lay up treasure in heaven that does not fail where no thief approaches for moth, nor moth destroys. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This calls us to a deeper level of commitment and discipleship. And discipleship is that, right? It's following Jesus. It is a, uh, it's a call to costly sacrifice for the kingdom. And what I find is that the more we sacrifice for the kingdom, the more costly our sacrifices for the kingdom, we will eventually know the joy of living for his kingdom and we discover that there are no sacrifices at all. Because his kingdom is our grand ambition. And we're doing this for the kingdom. Really, this is a call to divest and invest. Now listen, I know that there's other places in the Bible that tells us that uh, and lets us know that material possessions in and of themselves are not inherently wrong. I know that. I know that there are places that tell us that we have to work and that we ought to be mindful of the future and we ought to be able to have uh, money so that we can give to the poor and to help those that are struggling. I know all of that, but we're letting those passages preach for themselves. This happens to be a moment in time when Jesus is putting his finger on the ouchie. Jesus is exposing to his disciples and to those people who are willing to listen to say it's a matter of priority. You need to live vertically first before you expend all of your time, energy, and effort on horizontal living. So don't go out of here and tell them, the preacher told me to quit my job. <laughs> Read verse 13 again, right? Ill-timed interruption. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you work, if you do your thing, and they're secondary to the kingdom of God, you got the right priority. But also, if you're called to give it up, give it up. These passages will speak for themselves. This is a call for radical transformation of priorities. And we must heed them because our souls will be required of us. And there are too many people in these modern times in which we live that are enslaved by greed by worry, by anxiety, by, uh, by fear, too many. And God's church is constricted by these things. That when we as a people are consumed by our greed and by our, our worry, our anxiety, our fear, we hinder the, the growth and the work of the church. If you worry too much, that you can't participate in church, you affect me. Just like if I'm too greedy to be a faithful witness to God, I affect you. See how these things work? This is a call to radical discipleship. The days in our, in our lifetimes, the days in which being a Christian was just doing something that was acceptable have another name added to your obituary along with the uh, Lions Club and the Rotary. The, the, the days of just going along in Christianity to get along, they're over. We're seeing the end now. We're there. And the trajectory that the church is on is unflattering. And the truth is, this is a, raw, a, a call to radical discipleship in every generation. It just so happens that we live when, when we live now. Coming out of the excess of the last 30, 40, 50 years, and we realize that it's all vanity. And it's getting us nowhere. Our hearts just might be in the wrong place. Look at verse 34. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You think about this, we're worried about our, our, our portfolios, we're worried about our homes, we're worried about, our, uh, uh, about the interest rates that we're going to get on loans and uh, uh, paid at the bank. We're worried about whether we're going to be able to take our leisure. My friend, we entertain ourselves to death. We've got more leisure now than any generation's ever had. And we're worried about more it's divided loyalty, and God will have none of it. He says, put your treasures up in heaven. We'll close with this thought, if 
I were to ask you today, and it is graduation season, and we have a couple of young men who are graduating, and we're, we're very proud of them, but if I were to ask you, what's your plans after graduation, or what's your plans, young lady, young man in life? What is your plan uh, uh, for uh, uh, the future? We might begin by saying, well, I plan uh, to go to college. I plan then to... Uh, 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 you know, I plan to go to college, get an education, and I would ask you then, and then what? Well, then I plan on getting a job, and then what? Well, I plan on settling down, getting a family, married, family, and then what? Well, I, you know, I plan on living and accumulating some things so that I can retire, and then what? Well, I'm going to take it easy, uh, enjoy my grandkids, and, and then what? Well, I guess I'll just you know, end up in a nursing home. And then what? You got to force them. Your soul's going to be required of you. But in the same regard, you don't have to be young for me to use this on you. And I said long ago, that 35, six years in funeral business has skewed my way of thinking about things. And I know, I mean, I'll never be able to look at this. I, I see things in 10-year increments. Who's going to be around in 10 years? Where will I be in 10 years? Well, what's that going to look like in 10 years? Five years, a lot of times. I can't help it. I'm so used to burying people that I know. I don't, it's second nature to me. But I can ask you, middle-aged person, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to work my job. And then what? I'm going to take some vacation. And then what? You see, older person, what are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to live here off my retirement. And then what? You see, there's always going to be an end to the then what. What then? I hope and pray that you're not a fool who's despised this opportunity that Christ has given unto us to come unto him, all you who labor and are heavy laden, so that he might give us rest from fear, anxiety, worry, obsession, greed. What are your goals, your plans, your, your ambitions? And then what? Let us pray. Father.